grateful to, to be with you guys. Always an honor to open up the Holy Scriptures and to teach. Uh, think about this. This is a sacred moment here. This is a sacred moment. We will not get this moment back. Think about that. Before we continue with the reading of our sacred scriptures in the Bible, I invite you just to take a moment of silence and stillness and um, close your eyes. And if you want to, bow your heads and let's just give ear to the Holy Spirit and my, what he might want to be saying to us in this moment. Holy Spirit, may we... Be attentive and in tune to your whisper, to your hovering, to what you are saying in this moment. We give it over to you. We honor dads and we honor you. In your name we pray, amen, amen. Uh, for those who might not be familiar with me and my family, some of you are, but some may not be, uh, my wife Ashley and I are the Gen Now, what we call Gen Now pastors of the Oregon Ministry Network, uh, which basically means we have the honor and privilege of discipling, resourcing youth and children's pastors across 180 churches in our state. Horizon obviously is one of those. And we have the privilege of being on the teaching team here at Horizon. Pastor Stan asked me uh, in the fall of 21, and I was like, wait, what? You want me to? He's like, yeah, come on. I can see if I can do a Stan impression. Yeah, why don't you be on the stage, you know, every, you know, every few months or whatever and bring the teaching. And I said, wow, what an honor that is. And it really is an honor to be here with you guys. I have a picture of our family. My wife is right here in the front row. Uh, if you want to wave, babe. That's my wife, Ashley. Yeah, she's here. Uh, my kids uh, on the right, the right picture is Micah on his tippy toes there. He's seven. Canaan, who's lifting up his shirt like a thug. He's uh, four. And then uh, Kinsley is my little princess there. And uh, we, we are, it's, it's true. We, we, we really do need rest in prayers. Thank you. Appreciate it. They're all active kids and I love them all very, very much. If you have a Bible, uh, whether it's a physical Bible, maybe it's a Bible on your app, on your phone, or on uh, some other uh, device like that. Go ahead and flip to or search for Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. For those of you who may not know who Luke is, he was a physician in the ancient world who interviewed uh, people who walked with Jesus. Specifically, we believe he interviewed, uh, well, we believe he, he uh, in, took from Mark, John Mark, uh, his version of the story of Jesus who uh, interviewed Peter, the apostle Peter. So Luke was a physician who was very careful about writing his findings of the life of Jesus. And we find it in the, what I call the second Testament or the new Testament, uh, Matthew, Mark, then Luke chapter eight, verse 40. And we'll be, uh, we'll be bouncing around from verse 40 all the way through 56. But uh, first, we'll start in verse 40 through 42. If you are there, if you're ready, say, I'm ready. I'm ready. Ooh, strong. Nice. All right. All right. Cool. Here we go. Verse 40 in Luke chapter 8. Now, when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue. And falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house for he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. Let's pause there in the story. I'll never forget the phone call. My wife and I were waiting in line to enter the variety show at the Paris Resort Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. Because when you're in Vegas, you got to try and catch a show, right? Right? Ashley was about four months pregnant with our second, and the doctor's office was calling us as we were waiting in line to enter. My wife picks up the phone, and she was given news that would turn our world upside down. On the other line, the doctor said, you are going to have a baby boy, and we give him about a 60% chance of Down syndrome, and there is no telling how severe at this point. Have you ever been there? 
ever received unexpected news, unsavory news, unpleasant, an unpleasant diagnosis, walked away from a hurtful or difficult conversation that just left you in angst? Have you recently taken a stroll through Twitter or social media or watched any of the news lately and seen the turmoil of our world even? Put on your uh, first century glasses for just a moment and I encourage you to get a little nerdy with me, okay? I've got a nerd photo. This is the guy every time, every time you want to do a deep dive in the scriptures and get nerdy, I hope you think of this guy right here, okay? So we're going to get a little, we're going to get a little nerdy here. Um, the Israelite culture and society is tribal in orientation, Okay, in, the, in the first century, the Israelite, it's tribal in orientation as was most of the ancient Middle East, meaning the family is literally the axis of community. Okay? Community revolved around the family unit. The family unit. One of the things uh, this meant was that the most important information about any individual within ancient Israel was the identity of the father, their gender, and their birth order, okay? The identity of their father, their gender, and their birth order. So to be a patriarch of a family with zero children meant not only that you cannot pass off the family inheritance to a direct descendant, but it means that uh, protection and lineage as a whole was in jeopardy. The future was in jeopardy. Also, for, for a woman to be barren in ancient society was considered a travesty, to not be able to have kids. We see echoes of this with Abraham and Sarah, if you read the story there in Genesis. Uh, Ruth, you can read the story of Ruth and Naomi in the book of Ruth. Uh, Hannah, uh, and especially Zechariah and uh, Elizabeth in the story in Luke, specifically Luke chapters 1 and 2. A great read on this subject matter is The Epic of Eden. If you want to go even nerdier, read uh, Sandra Richter's The Epic of Eden. It's not a hard read. Uh, it's, anybody can read it. Pick it up. Doesn't matter uh, if you're, you know, even a, if you're a teenager or, or young adult and above. It's, it's a good read, um, and it's a great uh, picture of the Israelite patriarchal structure. So um, here in Luke, though, we have a father, right, who has an only child a sixth grade girl probably being prepared for marriage uh, with this backdrop in mind all his hopes and dreams for her and his family lineage all the desires and plans he had for her to marry his daughter off and unite his family tree with another is hanging in the balance as she lays on her deathbed and approaches Jesus, can you, can you feel the father's agony and desperation as he swiftly approaches this young, popular rabbi? Now, does Jairus love his little girl outside of cultural and patriarchal reasoning? I believe we get a resounding yes to that from the way he acts. It's not just the, the, the lineage and so on and so forth. But I want to point this out because my desire is for us to see the major societal, uh, societal and, fam, uh, and familial pressures and ramifications of your only child getting sick. Your only child. So let's step into the shoes of Jairus for just a moment and keep reading, okay? We'll pick it up in verse uh, 43 of Luke chapter 8. And Jesus went. The people pressed around him. So they, Jesus goes, is going to the house. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, who was it that touched me? He doesn't say, touch the garment. He says, touched me. When all denied it, Peter said, yo, master, the he probably didn't say yo, all right? <laughs> master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in on you. He's trying to be respectful and basically say, what are you talking about, Jesus? He's trying to be respectful here. 
But Jesus said, someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling, probably a very pretty embarrassing situation here for her to have to come forward here, falling down before him, just as Jairus did earlier, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her daughter, your faith has made you well, go in peace. Verse 49, while he was still speaking, some, uh, someone from the house, uh, the ruler's house came and said, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus on hearing this answered him, do not fear, only believe and she will be well. Verse 51, and when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter and John and James and the father and mother of the child. And all were weeping and mourning for her. But he said, do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. And when they laughed, <laughs> and they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. There, Luke is trying to get across to us. There's no doubt. She was D-E-D -E -D dead, Okay. She was gone. But uh, so, so they're weeping and it says, he says, do not weep for she is not dead. She's sleeping, knowing she was dead, but taking her by the hand, he called saying, child, arise. And her spirit returned and she got up at once. And he directed that something should be given to her to eat. And her parents were amazed but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. So after a week or so, a week or so after that Las Vegas phone call for us, we visited the doctor's office for an ultrasound, my wife and I. Um, we were optimistic and began preparing our hearts for this gift of a child being graced to us. When the doctor came in, tears in her eyes, distressed, uh, direct and filled with compassion, she said, your son has a condition called high drops. I am so sorry, he will not survive this. We would not know when, the timeline was uncertain, but outside of the miraculous, we would lose our second child. The walk for us to our vehicle from the doctor's office and the drive home felt like eternity, felt like an eternity. And I read this story in Luke and I often wonder, is that how Jairus felt as he walked towards his home with Jesus? Picture the scene. Father Jairus leads King Jesus, his ragtag posse of followers weaving in and out of the crowd. The crowd's growing as Jesus continues to walk. We know Jesus never hurried anywhere. You can read it throughout the four accounts of his life, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He doesn't hurry anywhere. He had a certain walk and way about him, a certain flow. He's never too hasty. He doesn't go too fast. He's never too slow. He's kind of like the guy that's always on time, right on time, even if you feel like he shouldn't, should have been earlier. And then you feel like he wasn't on time, but he, he's determined, he's purposeful. The crowd's pressing in on him, and he says... What's the, what's the dad doing right now? I mean, he, he, let's hurry up. Let's hurry up. Let's go. Jesus pauses. Someone touches, touched me. Wait, somebody touched me. Um, of course someone touched you, Jesus. We got to get going, right? This is what, this is what, Jairus, this is what I'd be doing. I'd be like pushing Jesus. Yep, yeah, someone touched you. Let's go. Let's go. Here we go. Chop, chop, chop. Let's go, right? <laughs> Someone touched you. Let's, let's get to the house. Imagine the struggle here with Jairus and Jesus. Imagine the inner turmoil, a prominent young rabbi and this powerful, most likely the chief elder of the local synagogue. The struggle that's happening. Who touched me? This is so good. This is so good. Jesus enters the house. The preteen is already pronounced dead. And what does Jesus do? He reaches down toward the deathbed and taking her by the hand, child, arise. Taking her by the hand. Let's not miss this. Let's not 
brush past this story too quickly. In one fell swoop, the Dr. Luke tells us Jesus is touched by a woman who is bleeding, probably menstrual hemorrhaging, and he then touches a corpse. Both actions instantly make Jesus ceremonially unclean, heaping double pollution upon him, and he does it anyway. He knows this. He knows this as a rabbi. What's the story of the Good Samaritan? We fall oftentimes in the story of the Good Samaritan in John. I think it's John 4 or 8. I can't remember. Uh, we, we fought the, the Levites or the priests or, or those who are uh, like similar to rabbis for walking around. But, but the fact of the matter is you knew that you did not touch a corpse. It wasn't or somebody who was unclean themselves. It makes you unclean as well. But Jesus does it anyway. I don't know your story. I don't know where you are in your walk with Jesus. I don't know all the different misrepresentations of Jesus in Christianity you might have been told. I don't know the pain, the hurt, the struggles you might have faced or continue to face, especially in this world that is spinning, seems to be spinning out of control. But I do know this, King Jesus is never outside of the reach of the broken human. He's never outside of reach from broken humans. When he is present, everything shifts. The room changes. The messiness of your life does not intimidate him. It does not matter your past. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter your family origin or history. It doesn't matter how dirty or unclean you feel or have been told you are. It doesn't matter how dead you even feel inside. Jesus is in the business of restoration of restoration, bringing people to life, new life. There's new life for you today. There's new life for you today. There's new restoration life available. Will you reach out? If that's you, will you reach out to him? Will you allow him to grab a hold of your life? And will you follow him? And that, this is not just for those who are contemplating Christianity, you guys. This isn't just for those who are like on the fence, unsure about Jesus, unsure about Christianity and what it means to follow him, the Bible and all that. This is for all of us. This is for every single person in the room. The ever prophetic, I've said this quote before here, is so good though, but the ever prophetic Eugene Peterson, he grabs a hold of the human condition in such a special way. He says, the Christian is a person who recognizes that our biggest problem is not achieving freedom, but in learning service under a better master. The Christian realizes that every relationship that excludes God becomes oppressive. Becomes oppressive. Everyone has a master. We all do. We all serve someone or something. And Jairus understood this. He got it. As a person who was in authority, he understood that he still was under someone's authority himself. And what he did as a powerful individual and a dad is critical for us today. Here's the truth. Right out of Luke chapter 8, verse 41. Here's the truth that I want to leave you with. I want you to remember and be reminded of. Real power, leadership, and manhood looks a lot like falling at the feet of Jesus, doing exactly what Jairus did and this woman did as well. Our world is desperate. Sometimes I would say our world doesn't even know how desperate it is for men, young and old, who are man enough to invite the presence of Jesus into their homes, into their lives, into their worlds, and to bend the knee in submission to his authorship and authority. We all do it to something or someone. Our society at large doesn't even recognize, recognize the greatness of this simple posture that Jairus does. How different our world would look. Especially if fathers who love Jesus, if we would say every day, Jesus, I submit my life to you. You're king, I'm not. How different our neighborhoods would look, how different our families would look. Our world needs it. Our world needs it. So what does this look like? 
It's great to say all that. It's like, okay, cool. I'm encouraged, kind of, Sean, but, you know, uh, uh, what does that look like? And so quickly, I want to give three critical ancient practices for dad. So ancient practices for dad, ancient practices that we all need to uh, dive into, that we all need to do, I would say, uh, that we all should enter into and find joy in them. But I want to specifically talk to fathers or fathers to be uh, specifically to lead the way in this. Uh, And if you are not a dad, uh, right, if you're not a dad, um, this is something for you to begin now as well, to prepare for that. So the first is Sabbath observance. Sabbath observance. When I say Sabbath, I'm referring to the the command, uh, one of the Ten Commandments in uh, in Exodus. Okay, that Moses receives from Creator God. If you don't know the story, look it up, read it. There's Ten Commandments given. Sabbath, Creator God spends the most time on, and it's the only commandment, and it's the only day that is considered holy. Twenty four hour period of ceasing. What emotions and thoughts rise to the surface when I say it is as wrong to violate Sabbath as it is to steal, kill, lie, and covet? (sighs) I'm a violator too, y'all. Okay. (laughs) You know, I, like I said, my wife and I have the privilege of of discipling and resourcing and walking with uh, a lot of youth pastors and children's pastors. And whenever I say this to them, I'm like, so, hey. How's Sabbath going for you? When I refer to Sabbath, I mean a time to cease from toil and labor and to do something that's restful, that refreshes and rejuvenates in celebration of creator who rejuvenates and restores. Well, I don't know, Sean. I mean, it's been rough, man. It's, I don't know. I'm having a hard time with that. I was like, oh, okay. I'm having a hard time with Sabbath. What about murder? Is that, how's that going? Is that all right? Murdering, you good there? <laughs> oh man, I'm a violator too. We're we're terrible at Sabbath in America. Americans are terrible with Sabbath. Part of it's because we don't really understand it. I think. I think we're not quite sure uh, how to really uh, grasp it and actually live it out and practice it. Uh, theologian Christy McClellan says that Sabbath is other than, more than, and better than we think. I would say that we could even imagine. Dr. Dan uh, B. Allender uh, begins his book on Sabbath by saying his, or God, his delight demands that I consider how little I know about delight. The Sabbath is an invitation to enter delight. The Sabbath, when experienced as God intended, is the best day of our lives. Without question or thought, it is the best day of the week. One of the uh, Hebrew meanings for the word Shabbat, which is where we get the word Sabbath, is to cease. To cease. Again, McClellan helps us. We cease our work, she says, in order to celebrate or elevate creator God's work in redeeming the world. This is not just a day off or a day to run errands, but a day to celebrate and to play and to delight in creator God and his creation and so much more. This is the time set aside, holy, holy, to refrain from all the toil and labor of the work week, to celebrate in a way that reminds you and I that we are not the creator of the universe and that is a good thing. That is a good thing. And when we do not Sabbath, you guys, we practice a lack of trust in the character and attributes of the Most High God. There's three helpful words. Man, I could go off on all this and we'd be here for another hour, so I won't. You're welcome. Okay, three helpful words. Celebration, feasting, amen. I'm Italian, okay, amen. And playing, okay. Celebration, feasting, and playing playing okay these are things that rejuvenate you that 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 bring delight to you and your day and your family in a way that you say you know what I'm celebrating creator God and creation so some of some of my friends they love to do yard work and mow their lawn I'd rather chew on rocks okay I'd rather not do that it's a 20 for us it's a 24 hour period we do sundown Friday to sundown Saturday and it's a rejuvenation we don't do the dishes ah we don't need we don't do the dishes it's fantastic we leave them in there my wife is a 
very clean person. So when the sun goes down on Saturday night, <laughs> guess what she's doing? <laughs> she's doing the dishes. Uh, <laughs> and I can't argue with her. Uh, anyway, so, so what, what bring, if we can keep these three words, celebration, feasting, playing, in the forefront of our minds as we move through our week and think through Sabbath, and I look forward to Friday night for us. Maybe it's a Saturday night. Maybe it's a Sunday night. Maybe it's a start somewhere. Maybe it's not a full 24-hour period. He's like, oh, man, I've never done this, Sean. Okay, start somewhere. Can you get an hour? Can you get a half a day? Okay. But if we keep these words in the forefront, it will help us move into and engage this day of celebration of the restoration work of our creator God. And my my thought when it comes specifically to the dads is when dad rests, Typically, the family will follow suit. Typically, the family will follow suit. So I have uh, some resources for you. I'm not going to throw them all up on here. Um, I do have some resources. I'm going to get them to Pastor Jay or uh, to Brogan, and we'll, we'll figure out how to get these resources to you just so you can see them. There's some, a bunch of books, and then there's a, a podcast as well. But um, I, will fire, I will have the team fire up one resource in a second. But So Sabbath observance and then table talk. Table talk is the second ancient practice. Sharing meals around the table is identity formation. I think I've said it here before at Horizon. I've talked about the table, so I won't belabor it. But this is a no phone zone. And I encourage you, four meals a week together around the table with your family. If you're not married or maybe you're, you're, uh, you've got a bunch of roommates or whatever, I encourage you. Grandmas and grandpas, maybe you're empty nesters. I encourage you, four meals around the table with friends, with family, with strangers, with acquaintances. Around the table, table talk. And then if you are young and and not sure, you're not in a, a, a relationship or maybe you're with roommates, do it now because you'll do it for the rest of your life. It'll set you up to do it for the rest of your life. Bring back the table and then um, I've got the resource I want to I want to throw up there is from Justin Whitmill Early. He's got two books: The Common Rule and Habits of the Household. Um, I encourage you, encourage you. This is the the one resource that I would say uh, get right away. Um, the Common Rule and the Habits of the Household. I say get them both together and start reading them um, and 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 start practicing some of these ancient practices. The third thing I'd like to mention ancient practices, scripture reading and memorization. Scripture reading and memorization. Scripture was meant to be read aloud. When I say scripture, I say, I say the Bible, our, our sacred writings, the sacred teachings, the story that we live our life by, okay? It was meant to be read aloud in groups. So anytime a letter was written to a church in the New Testament or the Second Testament, whether it was Paul and his letters, whether it was Luke or, or any of the gospel writers, uh, whether it was John or James or Peter, I call him Pete, it would be opened at that local church or assembly, ecclesia, ecclesia, okay? It would be opened and read aloud in front of the gathering and then the letter would be circulated around the region to all the other house churches or even maybe even a synagogue or two, Okay? It would, be, it would be read out loud. So the same goes for the entirety of Scripture, the oral tradition. There's something powerful about coming together like this in this gathering and reading the Scriptures aloud, which we just did. The problem I'm seeing, one of the problems generally is that follower in our culture is that followers of Jesus, we don't even know our story. We don't even know it. So when people come and start talking to us about the Bible, we can't, we're having a hard time to intelligently speak about our story. Dads, we must, we must read out loud scripture with our families. We need to read out loud, tell the story, memorize scripture together. Memorize a verse a month. I, I want to encourage you. Memorize a verse, one verse in the Bible a month with your family, with your friends. Grandma and grandpa. If you, okay, if grandpa comes up and says, hey, I would like to memorize one scripture verse a month with my grandkids. I guarantee you, you, you approach your grandkids with that, they'll jump in. They'll at least try. They may not get it. 
you know, right away, or it may take some time, but they'll at least try, well, Grandpa, Papa said so. Papa said, I know how my kids are. They, they, they love my father-in-law and my father. They love their Papas. If Grandpa did that, young guys, young, young, uh, young adults, if you will do this now, it will form you deeply for the future. One scripture verse a month. The first step, I would say, is to invite someone to journey with you together. Invite someone to journey with you. Three weeks after the doctor's prognosis that we would lose our son, his heart would stop. In fact, the heart of my son, three weeks later, Ezekiel Ray Silveri, would cease beating. I cannot explain it. To this day, I still can't. And maybe that's a good thing that I can't explain it. But Jesus has never felt so near to me and my family in that moment. In this case, Jesus did not grab the hand of my son and raise him to life. He did not heal him here on earth. But as a father, I was gently reminded years later from what I can only explain as a Jesus whisper, a Holy Spirit whisper in a time of prayer, as clear as a bell, Sean, your son is completely restored. Today he dances and one day you will be reunited. You see, this is the hope we have as Jesus followers. I don't always understand why some are restored here on earth as where we're at current in our current state and why some are not. But I do know this, that the narrative of scripture from beginning to beginning, as I like to say, Genesis to Revelation, the narrative of scripture consistently reminds us that what we see currently in this current world the state of this world is not it. It's not home as it should be and will be one day. My friends, where have you placed your hope? Have you lost all hope? You look around our world, maybe there's some some pain you've experienced yourself, so maybe there's just some struggle within your family or or wherever or whatever. Have you lost hope? To whom or what have you bent your knee? Any master outside of Jesus Christ cannot deliver on the promises and only end up enslaving us. Today is a great day to make Jesus your king if you've never done that. For those who have followed Jesus for a long time or are struggling, today is a good day to be reminded of the hope that we have in him. That this isn't it. There is so much more. There's a process of restoration that is continuing to take place until we believe Jesus comes back and makes all things new again. All things right. I'd like to invite you to just close your eyes for a moment. If you bow your heads, close your eyes, just shut everything off for just a second. And if you've never given your heart to Jesus, maybe you're teeter-tottering on it, maybe you've even been a part of Horizon for some time, but you're just, you're just unsure or you're, you, you have some struggles and, and maybe you're, you're just checking things out even, potentially. I would encourage you, it's a good day to give your life over to Jesus, the King the author and the best, the best master ever. If that's you, if you'd like to give your life to Jesus, maybe you've even strayed and you'd like to come back and be restored, you just say a simple prayer, Jesus, forgive me for doing life apart from you. I want to come under your authorship, your authority. I want to serve you and make you my king. You say a prayer similar to that, something like that. It doesn't have to be the exact words. 
He'll write you a new story. He'll answer that prayer. You let somebody know, let somebody know that you've prayed that prayer. You can take that connection card. You can grab a pastor. And I know we have people who would love to walk with you. Love to walk with you on this journey with Jesus. For the rest of us, I'd love for us to stand to our feet. And I'm going to, right before we uh, jump in with Elliot and the band, I'd like to pray over fathers, a prayer of blessing. Um, How many of you know that the role of father is so critical and crucial in our society? In one sense, in our culture, it's been downplayed and the bar has been lowered. And and, uh, I just want you to know, Jesus doesn't see you that way, dad. It is important. There's a reason why in the creation story, in our origin story, God creates man and woman. Both roles are huge. They're vital to a thriving society. And I just want to pray a prayer of blessing over you fathers. Say that 10 times fast. (laughs) Jesus, for every dad, every dad in the room, those who hear my voice and those who may not have been able to make it today, may they know that they are loved by you. May they, may they go as they go. May they demonstrate the strength of what a father is through the humility of bending a knee to you in authority. May your face shine upon them. May they receive grace upon grace and peace and a sense of your strength that has gone before them and that walks with them as they walk with you. And it's in your powerful name I pray this, Jesus. Amen.